Is that a mojito? Uh, no, it's actually a jalapeno cilantro margarita. Oh, I thought it was the mojito. I know, because you asked me if it was a mojito. What can I get you? Drunk? Welcome to episode 10 of Behind Bars, Cocktails and Wasted Nights. I can't believe it. We've come so far. I'm your host, Greg. I've been working as a bartender for over 20 years, and over those years, I've seen a lot. My goal here is to share some of those high and low lights with you. Quick warning, this podcast contains sex, drugs, and some language that isn't suitable for anyone under 21 years of age, so you gotta have some ID. Big episode today. I've got a story for you, and it will be followed by the first two listener submissions, so settle in. Okay, before we get started, you'll need a drink. For this one, I recommend the French 75. Chill a champagne coupe or grab a flute. In a mixing tin, combine one ounce of gin, nothing too floral. I like Bombay Sapphire. One half ounce of lemon juice and a quarter ounce of simple syrup. Shake that shit up, strain into your flute or chilled coupe, and top with two ounces of champagne. Clicquot works great. Garnish with a lemon twist and get rich drunk. And if you don't have that shit, as always, the enduring prescription from your doctor will suffice. A key bump and a shot of tequila. By the way, for the money, El Himidor Silver is the move. Okay, on with the story. It was 2012 and I'd been working the overnight front desk at the St. Regis in Aspen. The place was super bougie, like four to five star fancy. To give you an idea of how expensive this place is, it's where Mr. Cole, the owner of, you guessed it, Cole's, stays when he summers in Aspen. Well, there you go. It's the place you stay if you're one of those people who use summer as a verb. The overnight was killing me. Not only could I not do the job well, the hourly wasn't working now that I was out of the manimal spare room and into my own place. And beyond that, I could no longer leave my dogs alone at night and walk them the three times a day they needed while I was supposed to be sleeping. The pivot was inevitable, and I hated the cold, hard truth of it, but I was going to have to go back to bartending. That fall, Food & Wine magazine had opened up their new concept in the St. Regis, Chef's Club. It was a million-dollar kitchen with rock star chefs who you could watch prepare food from your seats since it only had three walls. This was great because the chefs employed there couldn't yell at and berate you since they were in view and earshot of guests. The idea was to fly in and board famous chefs from all over the country, and they would teach the kitchen their signature dishes until the seasonal menu was filled with cuisine from elite restaurants from Portland, Miami, San Francisco, and wherever else was trending. I give zero, and I mean zero, fucks about food and or wine. I get douche chills when a psalm tries to tell me about the wine I should pair with my meal. I don't care about terroir, spice, or tobacco notes, or whether the vineyard has south-facing slopes with great drainage. I'm already at the point where if I met the fucking asshole writer for wine label stories, I'd bitch slap them. This is a bigger wine that'll stand up to the richness of the short ribs. Go fuck yourself. They'd be con artists if they didn't believe their own bullshit. Besides that, I can't absorb the adjectives I'm supposed to recite about food or relay its preparation. My brain refuses. I just want to serve drinks, make money, and go home. I'm not asking a lot. This is all to say that despising food and wine, you can see the impending disaster of me working in a place called Chef's Club brought to you by Food and Wine magazine. But they were in need, and so was I. So as always, I lied in my job interview and got the gig. It's funny, isn't it, how we all lie in job interviews? Like, if you related what you currently do for real in your actual job in your job interview, you'd never get that job. Third-party billing is not your passion, you liar. But you had to tell that lie. And the fucked up thing is that the person interviewing you knows you're lying, but if you don't tell those lies, you don't get the job. Our entire economy is based on falsehoods. But I digress. This was a shiny shoes, impeccable pants, and perfect hair place. They gave us a horrible white shirt vest one piece that looked like it wanted to be a tuxedo but gave up halfway through. I called it a chest. The job was obviously super challenging for me. I'd worked classy jazz bars, but my resume years mostly consisted of behemoth sports bars and a bar where tone-deaf singers almost drove me to suicide after too many haunting renditions of summer nights crawled around in my memory. Now I was dealing with rabbit terrine, foie gras, and fucking sancerres. Ugh. I couldn't even remember the three different bread offerings, much less the four different butters that came with it, so Branzino was obviously not going to make it into my noggin. What's worse is that the place was shooting for a Michelin star. Yeah, somehow the elite status of a restaurant is based on the standards set by a company that works in vulcanized rubber. I don't get any of it. 
Be that as it may, Chef's Club decided to call in the cavalry and get our already killer staff, present company excluded, to step up our game even more. The cavalry came in the form of the flamboyant personal butler for the former French president Mitterrand. He would put us through the French dining service ringer in what I can only describe as the service industry's basic training. Pierre would set up the restaurant and time us as we inspected all the tables, and we would fail if we didn't notice the water glass wasn't at a perfect 45 from the wine glass on table 19 in under two minutes. Total dick. He gave speeches about being confident and superior to the guests, reminding us to stand straight and poised, never to look down a plunging neckline, make sure our asses weren't near the back of the head of a guest behind us and our dicks weren't in the faces of the people we served. Wine was poured ladies first, oldest to youngest, which I thought was super discriminatory and generally fucked up, because what if you fucked up that order? Then men, same order, then finally, for the one who ordered. I don't want to bore you with all the other bullshit, so I'll cut to the chase. Knowing what you know about me, you know I was fucking awful. Clearly in over my head, and I was drowning. And I was doing so in front of the entire staff. It was humiliating. I was seriously surprised I wasn't made to do push-ups in the rain. My only saving grace was that I could make Pierre laugh, but more importantly, Pierre liked his champagne microdosing throughout the workday, so as it wore on, he became slightly more forgiving. But in spite of all this, I could sense a firing coming on. I was the weakest link fucking up the rest of the chain, and I was scared because my front desk position had been filled and I had no other avenues of income in Aspen at that point. I was fucked. Until I had an amazing stroke of luck. We'd all been graduated from wine training, and I diligently copied the head waiter Gordon's test. Gordon was an English dude who could bullshit about the menu all day. Total assassin. He could sell you fucking spam after telling you it was sautéed au jus and folded into a seared pork belly dressed in clove or whatever bullshit he wanted to come up with. He liked me and helped me where he could. We were on to champagne. We were tasting the selections, and we arrived at a sparkling rosé that was a bottle in between the size of a standard bottle and a split. If I gave a single fuck, I could have told you what it was called. I also could have Googled it, but I just need to reinforce how terrible I was. I don't know what this bottle is called. Pierre, drunk at this point, because during the tasting he didn't spit and instead swallowed, which I gathered was a pattern for him, was giving me strange looks. Like, lusty ones. Unable to help himself, I guessed, he lifted another mini-ish bottle out of its wooden case and pointed it right at me. He looked me dead in the eye and said what he wished was a quiet whisper. You know what I do with bottles like this? I keep them under my bed and fuck boys like you in the ass. Now, the normal reaction of most people would have been shock. They would have been appalled. Not me. I was overjoyed. I immediately responded with, You guys all heard that, right? The staff nodded. I don't know how it goes down in France, Pierre, but in the States, that's sexual harassment. And to be honest, I'm feeling a little unsafe around you. I said, trying not to laugh. I had this dick by the balls. Job security? Check. I could literally file a complaint and fucking sue you, I threatened. He blushed out loud. An impotent apology fumbled out of his mouth, but I didn't care. I pretended to be upset, and our shift started in ten minutes, so I walked away. Fuck the bread, fuck the terrine. I didn't know how they made it, and turns out, it didn't matter anymore. Carte fucking blanche. While this was all well and good, I had forgotten the golden rule of bartending's pecking order. See, while in truth we're private contractors for a venue, we're not really beholden to managers and owners so much as we are to guests. At the end of the day, as fucked up as it is, they call the shots. This reality was much to my chagrin as a local foodie cunt decided to sit at my bar, Janet. She owned Aspen Magazine and fancied herself a food critic who went around writing mostly scathing reviews on Aspen restaurants. She'd recently sold it for quite a ton of money, but once a critic, she now spent that money getting wine drunk and reducing unprepared servers to tears. And instead of taking a seating at the kitchen's observation bar, this jet black haired, red nosed witch decided to have her dining experience at the bar with me. Shit. She immediately called me out for not knowing the bread or suggesting a proper wine for her meal, and when her entree came, she said, Now I was here in the spring. Tell me the difference between the sweet corn I'm having now versus the corn I had in April. That corn from April would definitely have gone bad by now, I said. This bitch. Ask a stupid question. No, she exclaimed. The corn in the fall is stressed because of less sunlight and it creates more sugars. For God's sake, you need to know this stuff or you have no business being behind this bar. She wasn't wrong. I was definitely fucked. Luckily, Pierre, who was not only bending over backwards for the New York Times food critic who was in-house, he was bending over backwards for me, and he came to the rescue. Here, pour me four snifters, he said, and handed me the Hennessy Ellipse. Now, I'd heard of and seen Louis XIII cognac, but this Hennessy Ellipse, I hadn't seen. He appeased Janet, 
pontificated about the wonders of her food and wine, and comped her meal as I poured the yak. Janet finished up and left with the parting words, Thank you, Pierre. And Greg, I hope I don't see you here next time. Have a great night, I said. What a fucking bitch, Pierre said, and handed me one of the snifters. You need one of these, he said. Ring me up and put 25% on it for you. I must return to my guest. And with that, he was off. I know I do a terrible French accent, but I'm just trying to bring some reality to you. I took a sip of the ellipse. It was amazing. Then I rang it up and realized just how amazing it was. 660 bucks a shot amazing. I regretted spitting out about $172 worth when I saw that. While it wasn't tens of thousands of dollars for a sexual harassment settlement I wouldn't see for years, a single tip paying my rent, $660 cognac, and saying bye to the cunty McCunterson, the cuntiest of all cunts, was worth it to me. And that pretty much sums up my tenure at Chef's Club. I quit as soon as possible and went over to the Hotel Jerome, which you might remember from a previous episode. Okay, now for a couple of listener submissions. We've got Stan from Aspen and Cam from Denver. The first is from Stan, Blow Cosby Moore. I call him Blow Cosby because as he gets his swerve on, he becomes more difficult to understand. Here's an example of Stan telling a story all tuned up. Hey, Studley, I got a zip zip out that door. (laughs) And then I went over and got the zip 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 That's pretty much Stan. Not to mention he's one of three black people in Aspen. So hence Blow Cosby. Anyway, here we go. So without further ado, here's, in his own words, DJ Stanton Moore or Lord Stanton Kyle Moore. Yes, I am a lord. This shit is true. Facts. In the words of Detective Lorenzo, shit, I don't know his last name, ask Studley, he is the trivia guy. But Denzel Washington's character from the movie Training Day, I am King Kong, motherfucker, is the title of this little story. There are occasions, celebrations, parties, or just official days that give you an excuse where you can just act a damn fool. Pissy drunk, drugged out, whatever you want to be that day. These occasions normally happen once a year, but not like the amateur nights like New Year's Eve, July 4th, or any whack-ass bachelor or bachelorette parties that you have endured. Fuck that. None of that corny shit. I am speaking of the big ones. Carnival, Carabana, hell, even Rumspringa, just to name a few. See, those nights like New Year's Eve don't turn us industry folks on because we're the ones providing the good time. The ones playing the music, working the door, cleaning up your puke out of the bathroom, cooking your food, and serving your goddamn drinks. Industry professionals, where do I fit in? Hell, I'm a DJ. And while I am not behind the bar, I am in the booth. Now this is where I think we should check your IDs to make sure you can handle it. Okay, you're good. But do realize, there is no guest list tonight. Regarding that shit, by the way, as you stand in line, do know it is more of a formality to make you wait outside. Oh my god, look, there's a line. We gotta go there. LMAO. In reality, we're just getting our buzz on and taking our final shots as a crew before dealing with you. Anywho. As I was saying, there are these huge moments, these celebrations where all can partake and the real party folks aren't stuck servicing others. Yes, the industry is there, servicing ourselves. It can be a dangerous thing. Or a beautiful symphony. You choose. Sounds like utopia, and in a town where the beer flows like wine, and the lines, well, they taste like beer or old socks depending on who you know, this happens twice a year. For those of you that know the event I'm referring to is an Aspen staple, a rite of passage for the local, transplant local for most, including myself. Legendary, epic, if not life-changing, I would say this is at least mind-bending. Yes, mind-bending. Based on the carefully curated buffet of drugs and booze one normally consumes on this day, it is safe to assume that this is a day when one discovers there is a little Hunter S. Thompson in all of us here in this little mountain town. You have to experience to know Highlands Closing. This is not a coming-of-age thing. This isn't your goddamn cotillion or quinceanera. This shit can be life-changing for a goddamn adult that has already decided that they're going to live here and disguise their true existence with pictures on Facebook of insane peaks, powder days, adopted dogs, and other people's children. It is almost as eye-opening as the time you stuck your finger in your butt in the shower because you liked it when she or he did it the night before. Is it really okay because you're doing it to yourself? Hmm. Sure it is. Anyway, back to the party. I was fresh off a relationship with a chick 20 years younger than myself. And yes, this is a common thing in Aspen, so don't judge. This thing lasted a few months. Some days she was dating me. Others, I was dating her. Who cares? The real connection was that we would go out, party, and fuck like animals all night afterwards. Good times. But of course, as we know, these things never last, especially last too long or last at all. So we are done. Perfect. Or should I say perf? It is kind of fitting, as that was the one thing that I learned from this Pop-Tart. Perf. Okay, 
So the party is full scale and several hundred folks. Trust, for a mountain town like Aspen, it feels like 7,000. I am truly enjoying the festivities and flaunting my self-proclaimed fame, my local celebrity status, and my existence as one of like six black dudes in Aspen. The combination of lack of sleep, mushrooms, booze, and snorting some stank socks 